So good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us um, on our webinar this evening. Um, as I've mentioned, my name is Michelle Maloney. I'm one of the co-founders and directors of the New Economy Network Australia. And I'm really delighted to have Helena Norberg-Hodge join us tonight um, from Local Futures and the Economics of Happiness. And in a moment, I'll introduce Helena and we'll kick off with our discussion. Um, in terms of a little bit of housekeeping, if everyone could please try to stay on mute. If you've got any burning questions, uh, the first half hour, uh, also Helena and I will be engaged in a conversation together um, and I'll ask Helena a little bit about her work um, and her inspiration and um, any further ideas she has for work that Nina and other groups like us can be involved in. And then we'll open up for questions um, and discussion with Helena, myself and yourself. Uh, if you do have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and I'll read them to Helena at the end of our half hour of um, one-on-one -on -one discussions. Um, and then after that time too, if you do have questions, you're welcome to turn your mute off and ask once I've asked you to join us. Um, first, I would like to acknowledge the traditional lands of the uh, Yagara and Turrbal peoples on whom I meet working and playing today. I'm in Brisbane. Um, I'm in Banyo, which is North Brisbane. And I'm kind of chuffed that my suburb's name actually means um, Ridge in the local language. And I live near the Nudgee waterholes, which are a very beautiful place. And Nudgee means black duck in the local language. So I'm living on a ridge near black duck waterholes and would like to acknowledge the um, amazing civilization of the First Nations peoples of this continent um, and acknowledge the elders past and present and the wisdom that has kept this continent in such wonderful shape. And I also like to acknowledge the impacts of colonization and that I am a descendant of the colonizing groups from, from Europe. And uh, a lot of my work I do with, in partnership with my um, indigenous and Aboriginal friends and colleagues to connect with the task of decolonizing our mindset in this beautiful continent and to find ways to not only connect with the work that Helena will talk about tonight, um, but I guess also to care for country more deeply um, than a lot of the colonizing uh, governance culture has allowed us to do so far. Um, before I introduce Helena, I just wanted to quickly, if I've got the right, share screen and just introduce the New Economy Network Australia. There might be some folks on the call tonight who are not familiar with Nina. And those who are familiar with Nina may not recognize our website. We've had a bit of a revamp. Um, Nina is a network of organizations and individuals who came together in 2016 uh, initially um, with a view to trying to forge a civil society network focusing on building um, social reform by working on the economic system. And our simply put goals are trying to create an ecologically healthy and socially and economically just society. Um, Nina itself is run by volunteers. We're all committed to the, the kind of the principles and the vision of what we're up to, but nobody gets paid to, to do this work. So if there are lumps and bumps in the recording tonight or in any of our website or in any of our work, please forgive us. Um, we are forged and, and run by people who have very busy daily lives and often do a lot of Nina later in the day. I won't talk too much about our tasks, um, but this year is the first year that we're really excited about. We've been building our governance structure for three years, um, and we've got a distributed governance system with lots of different hubs. The hubs are first and foremost a way for people to connect. You can see them just listed down the side there on the website. We have sectoral and geographic hubs, and we're just trying to find ways for people to come together, provide peer-to-peer -peer support, help each other understand the work that we're all doing. And I guess to give each other the, the key thing we need right now is optimism <laughs> to continue in the face of the well-needed systems change. So we run lots of online events now. We also have an annual conference. And I think I started to say, we're also trying to build a, a civil society strategy, which is going to capture the very diverse, um, but often similarly focused objectives within our network. Okay, so that's enough from me. Um, for anyone who is interested and doesn't know much about Nina, please do visit our website. The membership page tells you um, how to connect up with us. And if you come further down, you'll see that we've got um, a forum that we've just started, which will help members find each other. We've also got a directory and we have a rather remarkable um, journal that comes out every two months. The latest one is um, due any minute. Our volunteer editors have been busy 
working on um, the latest edition. So Nina, again, um, a wonderful network growing. We have several thousand people on our mailing list, um, nearly 300 paid up members, um, but we're still looking for more and more people to connect and share great ideas. So everybody's welcome in the Nina space. Um, a number of people have just been asking me in the private space if this is being recorded. Yes, it is. Um, the discussion with Helena will be up on our website, hopefully in a week or so. Again, dependent on our volunteer time. Okay, so without further ado, um, Helena Norberg-Hodge, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm sure many folks have heard of your wonderful work, a pioneer in um, the localization movement, but let's start by, and I'll just remind everyone, we're going to have about half an hour with just Helena and I chatting. I know a lot of people have just come on. Um, about half an hour for Helena and I to chat and then we'll open up for questions. So, so Helena, you're often described as a pioneer of the localization movement. Um, before we get into the details of your wonderful history of work, did you want to share with us like your definition of localization? What does it mean and, and what is the work that people are trying to achieve in that space? Uh, for me, localization is the new economy. It is the economy that insists on adapting to the natural resources on which we depend and in a place-based, bioregional way um, that is a type of re-indigenization. So it's fundamentally about coming back to the real economy, the water, the soil, the plants, the animals we depend on. And it is about coming back to life in terms of reconnecting in a human scale, human interdependence, where we also recognize the people who help to provide us with, with everything we need. So that um, we are insisting that this is an absolute necessity for genuinely ethical, genuinely responsible economic systems. We have to come back to a scale where we see the impact of our actions, where we recognize the living fabric on which we depend. And as we do shrink the distances and become more obviously and, and when the reality is imposed on us of uh, what we're doing to the living world, we become more responsible. By definition, we become more responsible. We start recognizing that the well-being of the whole is totally connected to our well-being. So we feel this is an absolutely ne necessary direction. However, we are trying to encourage people not to be fundamentalists, not to become rigidly attached to some notion, you know, we're all going to be eating only locally as of tomorrow. In many parts of the world, we'd be eating fossil fuels or cotton or sugar cane. Wouldn't be very good for us. It's a process. It's a process and it's a, um, a process which is already starting. You can take a lot of heart from genuinely, um, you know, studying and recognizing the extent to which localization is already occurring, and particularly also from understanding that this is what indigenous economies were about. They were place-based, localized, and on a human scale with these visible and, and very real uh, relationships that you just can't ignore, actually close to everything that you depend on. Sorry, you'll find with everything I'm very long-winded. You know, it's a, it's a complex process. It's, it's what we're promoting is something that is nuanced and complex, yet at the same time, it's very simple and common sense. Thank you, Helena. Um, Somebody has a friendly dog. Oh, Michelle can't hear you now. You muted yourself. That was probably your dog. <laughs> I muted myself with good practice and then I was busily telling folks, please mute yourself or we can hear somebody's dog barking, um, which is absolutely delightful, but maybe a little bit distracting. No, um, I was going to say, Helena, no, your answers are not long-winded. They're very important and we're very interested in your views. Um, so just to feed off what you've been saying, the idea of kind of getting back to the real economy I, I, I've always liked that concept. Um, in a lot of ways, people who are interested in localization are actually reacting against 
some of the forces of depends how you describe it could be globalization could be corporatization can you talk a little bit about the flip side of localization and what in a way your work is kind of responding to yes definitely i mean we are responding to the impact of a process of globalization that language was brought in by corporations that were pushing governments, particularly in the last 35 years, starting in the late 80s, mid to late 80s, there was a new uh, pressure to, um, to force governments or to pressure governments to ratify more trade treaties. And I say more of the process in the beginning was brought in after the Second World War as part of the Bretton Woods institutions, along with the World Bank and the IMF. They brought in a process called the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. And that had been going along and it was essentially, I think, uh, pushed and promoted by a lot of well-intentioned people, particularly in the political sphere political leaders who felt that the way to avoid another world war and to avoid another depression was to so-called integrate economic activity around the world. The assumption was if we became economically interdependent, we would be unlikely to go to war again and we would be able to lift all boats so that there wouldn't be another depression. Probably already at that, at that time, there were very big global businesses that were gaining a lot from this process because essentially integrating globally meant supporting global players to have access to every economic arena, to be able to move in and out without any tariffs or any protection that would prevent them from going into national markets. And because they were so big and so global, they had the advantage of using cheap labor in the former colonies, in the parts of the world that previously had been enslaved, and they had the privilege of scouring the whole globe for cheap resources. Well, in the late 80s, this was brought in with a renewed vigor, and I happened to be a co-founder of something called an International Forum on Globalization, and we were able for about 20 years to meet with about 40 of us from around the world to study the impact of the trade treaties from Scandinavia to Brazil to Japan, the US and so on. Unfortunately, we didn't have an Australian member, but, but uh, we had members from every other continent basically. And the picture became very, very clear that this process was negatively affecting the majority of people in each country. And tragically, our political leaders are still blindly promoting this process. And I believe in the belief that they, they still just believe that if we support global trade, this is the best we can do to strengthen our economies, to grow our economies. And what they're actually doing is growing that wealth into the now the Amazons and the Googles. It's becoming an economy of information and finance and with very little attention to production of any kind. Previously, what was very clear is that farmers everywhere in the world were being destroyed by this process. But now even industries are being destroyed and they're, we're going into this make-believe economy so we are actively in reaction to that already starting in the 80s we started trying to alert people to this trying to encourage them to do everything they could to strengthen their local economy with a very clear focus on local food economies so we have been pioneers i mean i have started in the czech republic in los angeles and all over the us uk even here in australia in 99 there was very little happening in in the way of local food initiatives and i was one of the voices that started uh, alerting people and and helped to get things going so um we we um yeah, we believe that this focus on local food economies is really the most important thing we can do. There's nothing else that everybody needs every day, needs every day. We don't need new clothing every day. We don't need new building materials every day. Water is the only other thing that is as even more needed than food. 
and generally it's not been as globalized as the food economy. So this is what we would urge people to focus on, but we can maybe talk more about that later. Uh, so that's been our work in response to this very frightening form of globalization, which we see happening mainly because of blindness. Blindness <laughs> by our leaders and even in the movements, the environmental and social movements. Mm. No, thank you, Helena. That's really terrific to actually hear the work you've done combined with an analysis of, I guess, the forces of globalization that you and others have perceived to be detrimental um, is quite helpful in seeing the responses. And that actually leads me to my next question. Um, I wonder if you could, and please feel free to talk as long as you wish on this topic, if you can share with us some insights into effective responses where you've seen um, localized food systems or localized networks of any kind sort of really pushing back at these um, uh, forces that are not so good for the local communities. Yeah, well, I, I must say that uh, every single day we get news of new local food initiatives that we've never heard of. And we were, I mean, we actually started promoting local food economies in the 80s. And, and we did a book called From the Ground Up, Rethinking Industrial Agriculture, in which we were arguing for the need for the shortening of distances and trying to show that what was happening with the long distances was that the giant supermarket chains and the big middlemen could only promote monoculture. And I do also, by the way, right now, want to warn against just using the, the language of regenerative agriculture, which has become very popular. And again, many, many well-intentioned people promoting regenerative agriculture. But unfortunately, that single term is not enough to ensure that we are systemically moving in the right direction. If we're going to use one word, we need to be talking about diversification on the land as much as possible and local adaptation, getting back to locally adapted varieties of seeds and animals and uh, all of the, in forestry as well. So, um, yeah, so I, um, I do every single day hear of new initiatives and, and I'm, you know, essentially what we see is that it's in our DNA. We evolved closely connected to the sources of our food. This modern fossil fuel driven urbanization that took most of us away from the land in the industrialized world is like a tiny second in our evolution. In a 24 hour evolutionary period, it's one second. It's nothing. And yet we're so locked into it and we're so often despairing with the idea that this has been there forever and we can't change it. So we want to stress that change is inevitable. Change has always been there. So one of the ways to try to, to think about this is to step back a bit and look at the bigger picture and free up our minds, first of all, to understand as i say that change is inevitable and now which way do we want to go we are seeing even yesterday so yesterday one bit of good information was that on a navajo reservation a big one in in the u.s where they were having to drive for three hours to a really abysmal supermarket to buy dead processed food and now they are starting projects to grow food again I was just hearing, um, and this was this morning, from someone who's been putting on web-based courses, and um, it's, uh, anyway, it's an American-based thing where um, they want me to do a course as well, and they have people like Russell Brand and Deepak Chopra, sort of quite, they've been more focused on the personal, spiritual, but now they're becoming interested in localization. And the people who run this, they were saying that, a few months ago, they decided to run something on regenerative agriculture. And they were just amazed by the interest. I'm trying to remember now. I think he said, oh, was it 50,000? Anyway, just a huge number of people 
signed up for this course on regenerative agriculture. And he was sort of asking himself, you know, why is this? Because I'm sure most of these people are not actually going to be farming themselves. But this thirst for an interest in agriculture is something that we've been documenting for quite a few years. I remember when our film, The Economics of Happiness, uh, was launched in Canada. I remember we were one of the people that launched it in Toronto was the University of Toronto. And there, the professor who was hosting it was saying that by far the most popular course now was in, re, in, in um, not, it wasn't called regenerative then, but in new food economies, an interest in food and farming among the students. So there is a very clear trend when you go close to the ground, you have to go beyond mainstream academia, you have to go beyond the media, and you have to look more carefully and you'll find that there is so much more going on than most people realize. Just today in the New York Times, they had an article about the local food economies in America thriving during COVID. And they were talking about how they managed to do it in such a way that they kept up this physical distancing and how, they, how they're thriving, increase in production. Just the other day, I was talking to a farmer here in Byron. I helped to start here four farmers markets and the same farmer, um, you know, we started, it took four years to start the first one in Byron. So I started promoting the idea and got a committee together in 99. And so about four years it took to get started. And then about a year later, when I was talking to one of the farmers, he said it was like entering a new galaxy. It was just a completely different experience because as a farmer, his whole life, he had felt like a sort of surf, that was his language, pressured all the time by the big market to produce standard products in larger and larger quantities at a lower and lower price. Now he had diversified away from just bananas and avocados to some vegetables, some other fruits, and had about 15 different things growing and was doing very well financially. I was so thrilled to hear also that during COVID, these farmers not only did really well, but because they had local relationships, they were able to double their productivity. In the meanwhile, in the big normal supermarket system, they were talking about flying in migrant labor into the UK to pick berries in season and so on. And there was a real, discussion about it because during COVID, they didn't want to be flying in people from other countries. Here in the local system, because they had people who knew them and who worked with them, who were happy to work twice as hard and, and of course earn more money. But there was this security, both from the point of view of the farmer and his relationship to the labor and the relationship to the consumer. Anyway, I could, go on and on and on. But there, there is really a lot of good news. Yeah. Our colleagues in Japan also have seen this huge increase in interest. And there's been a, luckily from local government upwards, there is now a pressure on the national government to allow them to maintain a law they have that protects the diversity of their rice varieties. Big business, the global economy, they're trying to get that law revoked and to open up further mm. to monocultural, probably genetically modified varieties. But from the bottom up, there's now more and more pressure in the opposite direction. No, that's wonderful, Helena. And I guess I just want to confirm, um, apparently they've been seeing similar uh, wonderful trends in Australia. I was talking to Kirsten Larson from Open Food Network today and have been watching the work of Nick Rose and Sustain and many other food groups in Australia. Um, and you'll be happy to know that your story just then um, of the strong relationships built at the local level have in fact, as you say, really been the difference between people in particularly urban areas having access to fresh food and not. Um, Kirsten was talking about a, a, an amazing coalition that came together based on all of the um, relationships that had already been building at the community and local level that helped a whole bunch of people that unfortunately were locked, literally in lockdown in their tower blocks, 
And this, these coalitions of food producers and food distributors helped those people um, sustain, you know, local, well, um, well sourced food. So it's, it's been a remarkable thing to see. Tell me her name again. Did, what did you say her name was? Oh, um, I can send you details, but Kirsten Larson, I'm sure she won't mind me speaking about her. I was looking to see if some of my food contacts in Nina are there, but um, both she and Nick Rose and a few others have done um, a whole range of data collection on the escalation of local food production through the pandemic. It's been a really great story, I think. One that I didn't know about until I heard from them. So yeah, it's great. Again, so much of this is so quiet and it's yeah. just it's never getting the media coverage it deserves. I shouldn't mm -hmm. say never. I'm very encouraged by this New York Times article. And apparently they're going to be doing a piece on me. They're going to be doing sort of a profile of me, and which will come out in about a month in yeah. the New York Times, which I'm very happy about because we do need to get the word out. And generally yes. speaking, this position is very threatening to this corporate run media and corporate minds that are still locked into pushing their you know bigger and bigger agendas and really absolutely that is the only way to go and sometimes i was going to comment that someone like um, myself and others who've been helping coordinate the kind of the growth of the new economy network you can almost forget that mainstream media doesn't talk about all this amazing stuff because we're in the sort of the the, the, the hub that looks at hundreds and hundreds of amazing Aussies doing such terrific work. So yeah. there is great stuff. And I, I really agree with you. We, we have to find clever, creative and ongoing permanent ways to get those stories out there. Yeah. Um, just a can, I, can I just say before I forget, I do yeah. want to say, Michelle, as I've told you before, I feel that you and your network is one of the most inspiring new economy networks in the world. Wow. And I feel that it is a great extent due to your leadership. I really am thrilled that you're a woman and that you're a woman who has a deep connection to indigenous people and nature. Too often when people think economy, they want to go straight for the technology, including money, which is a technology, <clears throat> a useful technology. There are a lot of technologies that are useful. But unfortunately, far too many people get blinded by those and, and see them as more important than life itself. And it's a simple sort of map laying of the world, but it misses the deep nuances of the incredible and essential diversity of life. So we have to get closer to that complexity. And I really, I feel your work is so important and I see you're one of the founding members of the Wellbeing Alliance. So are we, Local Futures is too. And I hope that you and I, well, and our networks can have more of a voice in that alliance. It has mm -hmm. a lot of potential, but I think it's still not quite grounded enough mm -hmm. in the land, in the real economy. And I also want to say, I really hope that you in Nina will get some funding so <laughs> please folks i did not set helena up to this sorry <laughs> i was just letting everyone know i did not set you up to say no, no you didn't <laughs> uh, but i really feel that we need to start lobbying funders with the understanding that because the information is so hidden both the information about the wrong path wrong being away from nature which means away from respecting diversity and if we cannot respect and nurture and, and restore diversity, we're, we're talking about death. We're mm. talking about moving away from life. So there's a certain structural reality here that we really have to pay attention to. And because the information is so hidden, and therefore there's so much work required to expose both sides of the equation, mm. the pro-life, as we can call it, and the anti-life one, we need people who can work full time on this. And so we need to have the funding both to do the research and then to disseminate the information. Mm. Because we have to push through this jungle of the internet, which is full of all kinds of things we don't want. And <laughs> it's hard to find, you know, real and accurate information. And we have to try to push into the media as much as we can, the mainstream media. Mm. Anyway, I really do honor and appreciate what you're doing. It's very, oh, thank very you. I really appreciate that too, because as everyone on this call is probably knows that 
often when you're trying to to do this kind of work there are days when you wonder if it's being of use and if it's if it's something you know that is worth doing so certainly feedback like that for the network itself not just for me or any ego for me i really value that helena because your experience and connections around the world you know really matter and mean something to the work we're doing in which case that helps me with my next question to you which is i was going to ask you um to talk a little bit about some of the most exciting projects and you've mentioned food but other ones too but perhaps i could ask you about the communication side of things you're saying what we really need to do is to get the stories out there about how important these local um, diverse nature-based initiatives are what do you see around the world as any good examples of how communities are able to do that how to break through the noise of the internet or the tv and actually share the good stuff well again i think my uh, one of my colleagues in japan is urging us to use more local media and i i keep meaning to try to do that to work more with local community radio and reach local media to start pressuring at the local government level mm. so in terms of exciting initiatives uh, you know as i say by far the most important is local food and that is happening not enough but it's definitely growing definitely and there we can see local governments responding we have examples of many mayors around the world from san francisco to seoul in south korea to bristol in the uk and many others where the, the local city governments have responded. We even have uh, some very significant shifts at the regional government in Canada. And so far, I can't give you any example of national governments, mm. uh, but <laughs> regional, yes, and city government. And then there are you know, other initiatives that include uh, local finance initiatives and our colleague Michael Schumann who I hope people yeah. will know about he's one of the uh, he's the leading really expert in the world he's a trained lawyer and a trained economist and he's been working on localizing for about 20 years and has come up with some very uh, important local finance initiatives and has been able to change some regulations in America actually at mm -hmm. the federal level but it's still essentially um, playing out at the regional and state level in America where they've been able now to change regulations so that you can start investing in local businesses. Um, and also um, what we have in America, by the way, I would say the localization movement is strongest in America. And, and that's where most of the innovation has happened in the beginning, probably because the corporate system has been so much more blatantly destructive there, yep. and because government has been so much more irresponsible than in a place like Australia or even in the UK or Sweden where I come from. Governments were providing a bit of a safety blanket. They had a little bit of well, sometimes quite a lot of meaningful support in health and education and so on. But everywhere we see that being stripped away by this takeover of global corporate influence, pushing our governments. And it's very important that we realize that that's a global trend, but that we also realize that there is that global trend of things happening from the bottom up. In Bristol in the UK, the mayor of the city who's become a colleague and friend, he also started a local currency and he and others in local government had 100% of their salary in the local currency. Wow. They also allowed people to pay some of their local taxes in the Bristol pound. But I have to say still it hasn't really taken off but it's been part of a whole movement where, again, the most visible, the most successful has been in local food. There's a lot happening in Bristol and the UK. And of course, we have examples of local energy initiatives, including in Australia. Probably most people have heard of the windmills in uh, Victoria. What's the name? I forgot the name of the town. But there is quite a lot of examples of community groups coming together to fund community energy mm. installations. 
On our website, uh, our website is localfutures.org, and we have a series that we call Planet Local, where we showcase some of these examples from around the world. We also tried during COVID to pull together a program to try to celebrate and to um, make more visible the global localization movement. And we decided to launch what we call World Localization Day. Mm -hmm. And that we're planning to now run every year. And we decided to make it June 21st at the time of the summer solstice. Well, in, 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 North, in the Northern Hemisphere, summer solstice. Because we're hoping that in the future, people will be able to be outside celebrating their connection to the earth. Um, so we did this program in, uh, that we launched on June 21st, and I made this super human effort to reach people who had a bit of a name. And I'm very, I'm very pleased to say I managed to persuade Noam Chomsky and George Monbiot and um, Brian Eno, whom I actually didn't know before, but he was a friend of a friend, and um, Jane Goodall, whom I had met and who had said she wanted to collaborate, and um, Eve Ensler, who did the Vagina Monologues, and, and Russell Brand. Russell Brand had been a bit interested in our work already, and he played a big role in this. And anyway, so with quite a few well-known people, we were trying to raise the, the visibility of the localization movement. And I hope that you will all um, look at that. We, 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 we were sort of in two months, we were just crazily trying to put something together. And next year, we'll be able to be more organized. I hope Nina will be involved. We we'll want to have partners from around the world and to have a, a program that really shows that all around the world, there is this celebration of a more earth-based, place-based economy. But please do look again, mm -hmm. you can find it on our website, World Localization Day. So the recording, the, the event was all recorded? People can... It was all recorded, but of course I did like an hour long or more, you know, conversation with lots of people and it's all reduced. We did, we did a four hour program and then we had four webinars uh, around the world. And then um, we reduced the four hour thing to two hours. So you can see a two hour program with those people I mentioned, a hundred voices, mm. including a network of women in Russia, a network of women in Brazil. Uh, the movement that's really grounded is primarily led by women. Mm. Um, and um, yeah. So it's quite well, exciting to see how much is happening. It's really yes. inspiring. Thank you for that. And just a quick note, what I will do is get the World Localization Day recording link onto the Nina website. We have a little space under localization and you and I are listed as people championing that, but we've got lots of other localization people in Australia. Um, and uh, one other comment I wanted to make, oh, further up, um, in our comments, somebody actually mentioned the name that I had forgotten. So thank you. I think it was Stephen. Um, the alliance of food producers who came and supported the towers in Melbourne were moving feast. Um, we we'll call Beck somebody. Um, but the only other thing I wanted to mention before I go to my final question for you, and then we can open up to the group. Um, oh, how interesting! I read another comment and then completely forgot what I was saying. Yeah. Long day. Um, one more question that I had for you. Oh, I wanted to mention that I'm currently using a group of lovely student interns to start writing up simple one page case studies about all the different and groovy things that are happening across Australia. Um, we've already started with Nick Rose at Sustain. We're going to be chatting to other food people. Um, we've identified a number of social enterprises and um, slow clothes. Uh, local maker spaces, lots of different case studies. So for anyone interested in um, Helena, I'll share them with you when we start putting them up onto a special web page on our website in case that feeds into your work. That would be excellent. Yeah. yeah. And I was just going to say for anyone else listening to this call, sorry, Dal? We need to have these layers, you know, because 
It reminds me of a friend of mine in Sweden in the early 80s who was teaching a course on alternatives and more ecological ways of doing things. And when the students were about to graduate, they were all feeling very depressed and wondering how they could possibly find any kind of meaningful work. And they decided to go on a trip to the north of Stockholm to look at alternative projects. So they mapped out this journey they were going to take over a few days. And then by the time they got to the first place, they learned about so many more things happening in the region that they never even finished the whole journey because there was so much more happening about four hours north of Stockholm than they had ever heard of. So this is also what I'm finding is that as you go closer to the ground, you'll be truly inspired by the amount of, of this sort of in the fork in the road, you will find that at every university, in every department, virtually in government, in you know, virtually everywhere you look, there will be individuals who are saying, no, this is yeah. the wrong direction. We need to move in this more life-affirming, just, you know, direction. And so there are, yeah, so, yeah. so many more individuals, so many more projects, so many more forms of inspiration than and you will find in the conventional sphere. Yeah, no, thank you, Helena. And yes, we will, you know, through our collaboration and beyond, find ways where um, Nina's um, wonderful membership and network and examples and case studies, I'll keep sharing that with you. And if you can keep sharing the international networks that you're working with with us, I'll try to, and we will all try to find ways to share that with each other. Um, and as, as you said, we're founding members of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, um, and the framing of new economy as well-being economy is turning into be uh, turning out to be a, a very handy one, one that connects with um, with a, a range of folks who might not be that excited by some of the the new ideas. Um, I think my final question for you, and we've now got about four questions from our lovely participants tonight, which I'll get to um, as soon as I ask this. My final question for you is: You've already said very nice things about our network, and I'm truly really grateful and honored that you would say that. But in terms of advice to Nina, um, you know, we're only a couple of years old, we're finding our feet, we're a very diverse network. And one of the primary goals is to help people connect and get inspired by each other. Um, do you have any advice given your long career in this space? You know, what advice would you say that Nina should focus on and shouldn't get lost in? Or do you have any thoughts on what our network, you know, should prioritize? Yeah, I would, I would say definitely that one of the big traps right now is the type of politics of identity. You know, I myself, in a way, you know, was stressing how women are playing such an important leadership role. But I want to urge that we, um, that we try to avoid this politics of identity where it's assumed in some way, you know, that the white male is the enemy, you know, the white males were the sort of founders of this patriarchal global system and they're the leaders in this sort of corporate system. Um, I, and, and that, you know, sort of in a way, as you polarize things, a woman of color is the heroine and the white male is the enemy. And I think we should be instead absolutely emphasizing the need to come together across every possible divide to focus on systemic change and have a very clear picture of are we genuinely wanting to support this path that will take us towards a shrinking of the gap between rich and poor and an, a, you know, a preservation of the real economy. Are we willing to yeah, to, to also go beyond this politics of identity, which with Black Lives Matter in America was beginning to threaten, you know, to create such a divide that there would be, it would be impossible to move forward because many white people were put into a corner where it wasn't possible to speak. And, and if they were reaching out and working with black people, they were, it was, they were accused of false alliances and there was, it has already been such a, you know, as I say, a demonization of all white males that uh, we've got to do everything we can to avoid that trap. And I think even in terms of organizing in groups, I would urge people 
wherever they are, to try to identify some like-minded people with whom they can connect. And not worry then about sex or gender or race or culture, cultural background, but just are we willing to sit down to look at genuinely transformative systemic change and with a very clear criteria that is this something that is going to reduce this you know inequitous gap between rich and poor which in every single country has been widening obscenely and many people don't know that but that's part of the whole thing we have to do is be clear about that. It doesn't mean understanding the global economic system. It doesn't mean being willing to spend a little bit of time to look at that and then to uh, be sure that we share this uh, clear social as well as ecological commitment. Mm -hmm. And I also there feel that part of this political uh, politics of identity means we have to be willing to go beyond left and right, political left and political right, and not assume that you know any and everybody who has voted to the right is the enemy. We have to try to understand what's happening to people as they're feeling completely marginalized in, their, in the workplace and in terms of identity. More and more people are feeling so threatened, so insecure, that their reaction is often to become reactionary and to become so fearful of, of the other. And particularly if the other is a different racial group, you know, be it Islamic, be it gay, be it, you know, uh, black, we have to try to do everything we can to come across these divides to understand better. And I feel the message of strengthening local economies everywhere and having it a very clear agenda that is it's not just about strengthening our local economy this is actually a global movement mm. it's something that can truly transcend left and right and that can help bring us together in a way that we we never had such an opportunity because we've never had literally every person threatened by an economic system that does threaten life itself and that you know with, with climate change and with viruses you know we're we are now sharing a vulnerability that is also an invitation to a coming together across divides so making a superhuman effort to to go beyond those sort of categorical divides i guess is the maybe the most thank you important. No, I, I appreciate that and certainly value the passion that you bring to that topic too. So it's, it's excellent. Um, I'm just going to go to some questions now and if um, folks could bear with me, there was a couple of questions further, further back in the talk. So I'll start with them. Um, Charity has asked, um, I'd love to hear the speaker's views on the emerging social enterprise efforts and how Nina fits with that movement. Um, I can certainly go first, but Helena would love your thoughts on the role of social enterprise in the localized localization movement. Um, certainly the New Economy Network um, has a huge variety of folks who may define themselves as social enterprise. Um, we have a particularly strong cohort of folks who are deep believers in cooperatives um, and the principles of solidarity and mutual support uh, that come with the creation um, of co-ops. So Nina certainly sees um, all forms of business structures that are moving towards egalitarianism in the workplace, sort of work democracy, as well as, I guess, the true definition of social enterprise, which is often something that um, works not just for the profit of um, the old idea of stakeholder uh, shareholders, but ensuring that social objectives are met as well. I mean, to me, all of those core elements of organizational structures that work towards social justice are really important. Um, Helena, what, what is your take on the role of well, enterprise? I would just say that um, by you know, using the language of local doesn't necessarily at all make it clear, but certainly in our work we try to make it very clear that we feel it's really crucial now that we always try to look through the lens of the social and ecological framing. And therefore I'm not a great fan of just using the word social and just focusing on the social equality metrics but simultaneously how do we 
encourage a shift that is also ecologically beneficial. But you know, in the same way, I'm feeling right now that if we use a flag that's only green, so you know, if we call it ecological economics, we're less likely to reach people who are voting to the right and who have become afraid of green as something that is going to be too expensive and that doesn't care about me and my job. So I think we need new language, and I'm sure that most of the people in the social economy sphere are basically on the same page that we are. But I think trying to rethink the language is important, and I don't want to insist on local. I'm sure there are other things we could come up with, but I, I also, as I test and try and look, I think this notion of here we are, we want to try to strengthen the local economy. We want to try to see money there circulating in a way that means that when you spend money, you're actually benefiting the people in your area. That all has a resonance with a lot of people. Our biggest critics have been left-leaning intellectuals who have had such a commitment to international solidarity that they haven't understood that the that localization in it well it, it depends how you define it but certainly as we define it is in no way some kind of selfish um, jingoistic or nationalistic uh, approach no it's about taking responsibility it's about also being willing to sacrifice a lot of the cheap you know imports that have been made by slaves elsewhere. Mm -hmm. and, and our approach has also come from working in China on the ground, in India on the ground, and seeing that this era of globalization has not been beneficial for the majority. So that a lot of people on the left bought into this idea that this was a way of raising all boats, you know, globalizing and taking our industries over there was going to help them. No, it, it helped you know, those eight men who now control more wealth than half the global population, so. No, thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions, but I'm going to be a little biased and jump to a question from a young person. Um, she's 22. So Phoebe has asked, um, she says, I'm 22 and I'm trying to figure out my pathway in specific place in the localization, community development, food growing, new economy system, new earth system, do you have any specific um, ideas about, she's got any specific avenues best to go down? At the moment, I'm delving into the community development route from an environmental route, but I'm open to um, other ideas. She's asked about specific gaps or spaces in the, in the movement. Um, I have to say, I get this question a lot from young people. Sorry, I've had a little bit of a glitch. I'm glad I'm still here. Um, we have this question a lot from young people, this feeling of um, wanting to connect with work that's important, you know, work that, that matters and are there spaces and gaps for them? What, what would you say to Phoebe and to others who are young and wanting to find them? Um, I guess I would say that um, one, one problem has been that my colleagues, and you know, I started with all this work in the mid 70s. And I knew virtually every environmental leader in America and most countries in Europe, not in Australia. And uh, from my point of view, one of the problems was that many of the environmentalists understandably wanted to earn a decent living. And then what gradually was happening was that as big business got involved, often out of sincere, genuine concern, but as they got involved, they weren't going to be questioning the centralizing part that concentrated wealth and power in fewer and fewer, bigger and bigger businesses and corporations. So as I see it, a lot of the problem has come from the environmental movement accepting funding and ideas from big business. Now, a lot of this has not been conscious. So I'm not, I don't know how many people have seen that film that um, Michael Moore produced recently on renewable energy uh, that demonized people like Bill McKibben, whom I've known for about 40 years. And I'm absolutely convinced that he chose his path out of absolute conviction that the only way to deal with this is to work with big business. 
Now, I don't agree with that. I mean, not when I say work with big business, I'd be willing to work with them if they're willing to, to choose to shrink, to literally move in a direction where more human scale enterprise and smaller entities have a chance to survive. Because by the way, I like to talk about the three Fs, farming, fishery, and forestry. Please remember that in those areas, the efficiency of a scale is the smaller the better. And I, this is almost an absolute, of course, not down to a square inch or something, but please, please remember there is no efficiency of scale in the three Fs. And so I think this is a tragedy that people have not been sort of marrying their knowledge of ecology with their knowledge of what was happening in the economy. So what I would like to say to young people is consider being willing to take an ordinary job when maybe not horribly ordinary and certainly not going into some kind of weapons manufacturing or toxic anything, but be willing to maybe think of doing some ordinary job and then liberating yourself so that you can perhaps spend a day a week or you can perhaps uh, even, even find more freedom by um, working for a couple of years and saving and then having some way of being a little bit freed from uh, the obligation to just pay uh, mortgages or keep on the consumer track. You know, if you liberate yourself a bit, you might find that you can live on a lot less than what we normally assume. A friend of mine did a book um, in this, was it in this, probably in the 70s. It was called Your Money or Your Life. Mm, and it was quite an instructive book except it was done in America. And so they were suggesting that people try to, you know, get off this track of consuming and feeling they had to earn more and more. And very often people who said, I don't care about money, still became wage slaves. So they were suggesting that you try to liberate yourself and save a bit of money and then maybe invest it in the stock market. Well, today that isn't exactly an option. But it is an option to perhaps come together with some other people and maybe buy a house together or something that can be an investment that you can maybe then have some security from or consider an MO, you know, shared bit of land. Um, and yeah, just try to um, not assume that you're going to get a well-paid job doing the right thing. Right now we're in a climate where doing, as it were, the right thing is almost always going to be demanding that you work as a volunteer or for much less than you would in another job. I'm mm. sorry I'm to say that. But I also want to say that the people I know who are close to the ground and who are particularly involved in the local food movement in one way or another, are among the happiest, healthiest, most energetic, most vital people I know. So also keep that in mind. When do you feel really good and happy and, and just, yeah, healthy and happy? Listen to that, not just your heart, but to your deeper wisdom, to your body, and, and try to go with that instead of following the dominant track and don't worry about being important don't worry about having lots of phds and don't think that if you climb higher up in the academic world that you're going to get to do that really nice job because you have a phd i would say i don't know maybe you would differ with that michelle because you not at all PhD. not i mean sorry I was going to say, people like me who have a PhD often talk other people out of doing PhDs quite actively. But I would just agree um, with what you've said about just try to follow the things that you are most passionate about because all of this work takes a huge amount of commitment, um, resilience, because you're going to get burnt out and sad and, and full of grief about the state of the world and the state of humans. So the reward has to be within the work so that you have your little, what I call the my Duna days where you feel sad and then you get back up again and keep doing good deeds because it's the thing you love and it's the thing that you know is important. So, so good luck. 
And also, uh, Phoebe, if you want to volunteer as a student intern of any type with Nina, we need all the help we can get. So N-E-N-A at neweconomy.org.au. I desperately need people to help with a whole range of communication, admin and connection and networking tasks. So there you go. If you want to find a way to find other folks, Nina's ready to take, take your email. Um, thanks for the questions, folks. Got another one here. A great question from Anne. Um, Helena Ann has asked, as a long-term community development practitioner supporting bottom-up CD, I see strong commonalities between CD, community development, and localization. Is there any work that, um, that you know of that has explored those two approaches? Well, I think there's a huge difference between the CD and the global south, so-called, or in the less industrialized countries and in the industrialized world. So one problem that we have to look at is that the community development work in the less industrialized or so-called, you know, third world or global south countries, um, there's a lot of nice language about local participatory development. There is an emphasis on going into the community and asking people, what would you like? What I discovered years ago was that this approach arrived after television. Once television was beaming into the huts of the Maasai or in the yurts of Mongolia or on the Tibetan plateau where I was working, then there was suddenly the fashion that, oh, no, no, we don't want any environmentalists from the industrialized countries coming here telling people what to do. The television was already telling them what to aspire to and was already pushing a, a really exaggerated, romanticized view of an urban consumer culture. And then the community development was coming in and saying, oh, what would you like? And then often what they wanted was a new road and they wanted electricity to have more television. And that may sound a little bit exaggerated or may sound, you know, patronizing vis-a-vis -vis those people, but I've had very, very intimate experience of it in Ladakh and Bhutan, but also confirmed from having written this book called Ancient Futures, um, which was based on 16 years in this ancient Tibetan culture where when I first arrived, I learned to speak the language fluently and found people who were happier and healthier than any people I had ever encountered. And I, I lived with them for years and I, there was a, yeah, I mean, I, there was just never a question of anyone saying to me, oh, we're so poor, we're so stupid, and can you please help us? On the contrary, and then I saw with the advent of the development pressure, with the whole machinery, the opening up of the roads, and then with advertising and later on television, I saw the same people suddenly describing themselves as poor and backward and feeling they needed these changes. And, and I saw at the same time, people becoming less healthy, very clear deterioration in physical health, and above all, a very clear deterioration in mental health. Suicide was something that had happened maybe one in a generation. Now there's about one a month and it's young people. So it's pretty black and white when you see it there. So just be aware when you talk about community development to look at it very differently from how you might look at it here in Australia. And in Australia and in Sweden and in the industrialized world, this fashion of asking local people what would you like simply doesn't happen the developments come in and are pushed on us whether it's the new road whether it's 5g whether it's a, a mining project whether it's deforestation local people are not asked what kind of development would you like and so um, when you now talk about community development here in australia uh, I'm not, you know, maybe I should have asked you more exactly about what kind of community development you're talking about. But certainly at a, at a, at a certain level, yes, localization and community development could be synonymous 
if we're talking about strengthening the community economy, helping to strengthen a, a series of more human scale enterprise uh, and businesses, you know, smaller farms and particular focus on businesses that are providing for real needs, uh, minimizing the businesses that are just about tourism or um, consumer trinkets, um, but providing for real needs. And I'm not sure if I answered that question very well, but if you have a, a follow up, that's fine. I'm mute again, talking to you. Gosh, I'm clever. Um, <laughs> that's when I normally make a joke about having a PhD. I'm so smart, I can't turn the mute button off. Uh. I was saying, thank you, Helena. I think that's a thoughtful response. And certainly if we had more time, um, we'd come back for some follow-up from Anne. Uh, and we may be able to. Um, got a couple more questions. Please bear with me. I'm trying to be fair and work my way through them. Um, Fiona has asked a, a really interesting question about investment and funding. So she's put, um, the money pools in the current system and people who invest into that paradigm often feel threatened by the ideas of an alternative approach um, because sometimes it would require a shift in their sense of identity. She's wondering, um, from your perspective, Helena, who do you think has funds in the current system who might actually be interested in creating a new system? And she puts, this is a serious question, I'm not being sarcastic, and yeah. it's a really good question. <laughs> Well, I'm thinking particularly, of course, of those who are heading up foundations and who are philanthropically minded. I see there uh, a big time gap where many of them are still wedded to more single issue approaches of dealing with specifics of whether it be specifics in ecosystems or particular groups that are disadvantaged. And I would argue now that we should all be looking for shifts that are really systemic. There are things that we can do that will simultaneously increase human and ecological well-being. And we should be trying to, to identify those. And so part of our task is to try to educate that small minority of people who are actually you know, whose brief it is to try to do something to make the world a better place, but who, as I say, may be focused on single issues. And of course, many of those single issues are very important, but even those, if approached with a broader, what I call big picture activism, can be, um, it can involve projects that will have multiple benefits simultaneously. And so, for instance, that's with local food initiatives. You're talking about restoring biodiversity, you're reducing plastic use, you're reducing transport, you're reducing the, the uh, you know, about literally reducing the need for chemicals on the land because as you diversify, you automatically encourage more ecological production. You're talking about improving people's health. You're talking about huge spiritual improvement. There's now increasing evidence that the deep connection to nature and to community, which happens through now many of these local food initiatives, it happens as a sort of byproduct, but there are also initiatives, for instance, written up by Johan Hari, who wrote a book called Lost Connections. It's about depression and he, came, he himself had suffered from it, and then he came to realize that the drug path on the whole doesn't work. And what does work is connection. And he cites some beautiful examples where more or less by chance, therapists found that encouraging people who suffered from depression to come together and start projects was meaningful. And one of the beautiful examples is that these patients themselves decided to start a garden and as they then later said, as the garden blossomed, so did they. For me, these are, these are all bits of information that all point in the same direction. So here you're talking about you know, healing depression as well as healing the land. You're talking about you know, practical support through community building. You're talking about, yeah, anyway, I, you know, the, the, this again comes back to how localization is this win-win-win 
strategy and I would I would hope that we could persuade more um, people in the philanthropic world to join that. I think there are also foundations that now want to do some good, you know, sort of projects. Uh, and, you know, I think it's fine to accept funding from them, but I want us also to keep up the educational process that will pressure them to make more fundamental changes to their modus operandi in terms of how they make their money. Uh, yeah, my burning question to follow that up is how do particularly, I mean, Nina is, you know, we're not made up of massive organizations. We are by definition, a network of individuals and organizations coming together, but how, how do groups like Nina as a network or our individual members and network members have a role in educating funders if they're not actually getting any funding? I mean, what, what else can we do? Well, not what else, we've hardly tried as Nina to do any funding support yet, but what kinds of things can groups like us do to, to educate those with money who might wanna be looking for good projects? Well, I think, you know, doing webinars like this and recording them and creating educational materials about the actual work that's being carried out, but not neglecting the theoretical. Yeah. What I'm seeing is, if you haven't heard of a book called Don't Think of an Elephant, Love for it. me that's an instructive, um, very important thing to think about. This was uh, a linguist in America named uh, George... George Lakoff? Yeah, George, George Lakoff. Love this book. He, he has pointed out after Bush was elected that the Democrats had not devoted enough time and funding to think tanks, that the neoliberal agenda had been sort of bred and, and, and nurtured in right-wing think tanks, and they'd been putting out these ideas about, about society, about how life uh, functions, about history, you know, the framing. For me, what was frustrating about that was that this was still locked into an industrial Fossil, when we say industrial, remember we're talking about a fossil fuel based way of doing things where these three F's of forestry, fishery, and farming were in a very destructive way, very rapidly pushed towards monoculture and larger and larger scale. Now, that and that means also concomitant urbanization, which is very destructive. We increase our ecological footprint through urbanization. So we really have to rethink some of these fundamentals. Now, in that book, the framing was still, for me, completely outdated and missing the point. Missing the point of how do we actually restore the real biodiversity that is the foundation of life and it has to be the foundation of any healthy economy. That was missing completely. Now, that the language of local and the way we define it is trying to address that. That type of think tank work, in other words, why globalizing versus localizing is so important, why global has to do with more and more energy, more and more technology, more and more monoculture, more and more speed, more and more distance from nature, more and more breakup of community, why localizing is about slowing down, scaling down, connecting to diversity, both human and biological, ecological, and how this trajectory is so fundamental. That think tank work has not been done. And I, I, my organization, Local Futures, is one of the pioneers in that, but we're a very small group and limited funding and so on. So I think there, there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done that does need more funding, you know, to do more of the research, as I said, to spell out evidence in both directions and also to then disseminate it. And how do we do that? Mm. So, you know, to the extent that we can, um, you know, try to do what we did with World Localization Day, put together a program with different voices, use film, and, and combine it with statistical evidence, but be careful that we don't um, become overly academic, you know, trying to keep language as simple and clear as possible, trying to minimize the amount of, of st statistical 
evidence so that we can get a clear message up and then back it up with the statistics and back it up for those people who want to have more evidence. All of that type of work is what we need to do. So again, when I look around the world, I'm finding that the interesting work, which also a defining characteristic is that it's more holistic. It's another way of saying social and ecological at the same time, more holistic. And there, the interesting work is in alternative institutions, you know, alternative colleges, which are now starting to do things, some of the alternative publishing houses like Chelsea Green in America, and yeah, alternative journals, resurgence in England, to some extent, Dumble Feather here in Australia. And our new economy journal. No, thank you, Helena. Oh, is there a new economy journal? Yeah, it's um, it's run by two wonderful young uh, law graduates who are both doing various work and um, oh. studies, Duncan uh, Wallace and Jacob Debit. So the new economy journal is on our website. If you go to the website, oh, I didn't know that. We'll find ways to make it more prominent. But we have so many wonderful things we're trying to make prominent. But the new economy journal last year was every month. And people from all across Australia are contributing. It's wonderful. And now, simply because of um, demand and time, uh, the guys are going every two months. So, in fact, the latest journal is out, will be out this week because they've just uploaded it up to the website and stuff. So, so that's exciting. It's between the journal and then hopefully this emerging project around our case studies, we'll have a number of stories to share. And I appreciate your, um, your ideas about showing people, you know, what we're doing. And I, I just, if you don't mind, just want to give two plugs to anyone listening to this uh, webinar tonight or in a recording later. Um, there's two opportunities. We've got a, something called Beyond Crisis, a webinar series from the 17th. It's in two weeks' time it starts, from the 17th to the 21st of August. And the reason it's exciting is that um, uh, Tracy and April from the Valley Centre and myself have been working on a project. Every session has Indigenous wisdom and non-Indigenous speakers from Australia. And Friday is stacked with corporates and philanthropists um, because Beyond Crisis is all about trying to bring um, money into the situation because what we're hearing about the pandemic um, uh, is that a lot of funders themselves are really struggling with their own business model and struggling with where best to put their funds. And uh, we're kind of pretty keen to say, We've got some ideas of where you can put some of your funding. But anyway, beyondcrisis.org.au. Um, it's an initiative that involves AILA, NINA, the Valley Centre, Pingala, and Future Dreaming. And the other thing is for anyone listening, um, I was nodding about the George Lakoff book because I agree with you, his analyses were flawed in some areas. But for someone who's not a communication expert, some of the key ideas he had about framing, some of the work that Common Cause Australia talk about. Um, but we have a wonderful mini workshop. The Nina Hub um, that focuses on narratives and stories is actually having a webinar, an online workshop next week with the wonderful uh, Chris Reedy from UTS. He's a professor of communications. It's 11, Tuesday, the 11th of August at 10 a.m. And I just want to mention it in case anyone on this call is interested in how we, um, we're actually going to be discussing in great detail how we best communicate about the new economy in the Australian context. And uh, Chris has lots of suggestions from many other alliances around the world looking at building back better and all of that. So sorry to interrupt our flow with a quick plug, but I may forget otherwise. Um, it's 7.22. I think we might have time for one last question. Um, there's a question here that a bit different for you, uh, Helena. And I like this question. Um, Michael has asked, uh, do you see an opportunity to automate manufacturing of devices locally using global designs for example equipment that's necessary for modern communities what do you think about that helena i think that's a really good question there's a project called fab city that some of my colleagues are excited about um, i definitely see an opportunity for using the same or similar tools around the world to produce some of the equipment that would be very useful. So we worked a lot on appropriate technology in, in Little Tibet or Ladakh and in Bhutan, and then later on also in Nepal and some other parts of India. 
and then we are connected to other groups in other parts of the world. And what we found was that there were quite a lot of technologies that were brought in before all this um, very high tech electronic stuff were brought in. And they were, you know, tools like lathes and, and you know, still using uh, metal, you know, we used to actually make hydro turbines that could be manufactured in, in India and so on. And then that would have a life expectancy of literally hundreds of years. Many of these things have been around for that long. There's also a very simple pump called a ramp pump that our appropriate technology guy could make simply out of pipes and and it's a way of using gravity to raise water to about 40 times. I won't go into all the details, but, but anyway, I found that technology at that level is comprehensible, where a lot of people can be involved in the actual manufacture of the technologies that you're going to depend on. It's a very different animal from what's now being put out um, with a lot of, I believe, corporate propaganda for 3D printing. And the 3D printing technologies generally are using plastics and toxics. I've been at some of these labs, you know, some of these fab labs in some cities, and you know, even the smell and the atmosphere, and it's just, uh, I, I'm, I'm quite prejudiced, I'm worried that it's being marketed as this very decentralizing um, opportunity for local communities to, as you say, manufacture a lot of things that you need. I would like, uh, that's my prejudice and I, I have to be careful, you know, I'm, I've, you know, especially having been to places where they are happily using 3D printing for food. I'm, I'm not just prejudiced, but I am in a very informed way warning against that. I'm very, very clear having worked, you know, from the high altitude desert in Ladakh and seeing that in the traditional agriculture, which by the way, in Asia, there were agricultural systems that thrived for thousands of years, thousands of years. So part of the myth as coming from the corporate world where we've been, you know, surrounded by myths that all the time perpetuate the idea that we need more technology and larger scale to move forward, to mm -hmm. feed the world. Mm -hmm. Basically, I found that in the traditional system there, the yields were higher than the average yields in America. And this was just using animal labor and human beings. And, you know, you read about dark emu and what was going on here in Australia. There were ways that land was managed in an intelligent way that was far more sustainable. So let's be very, very careful to examine first the truth about what would be possible if we could restore the right level of human labor and animal labor to any given task of growing food, of building houses, of creating fiber for clothing. I think we'll find that there's an amazing opportunity there to actually make use of the most abundant renewable resource of all, which is human beings. And we are in great danger of choosing a path of using energy, and scarce minerals. This is one of the most dangerous things about 3D printing and most of the electronic stuff is they're trawling the seabeds for minerals. And they're talking about they, you know, the Elon Musks of this world are on a competitive race on their way to Mars to try to get more minerals. Anyone who is listening to this program, I hope will very seriously consider the, the irresponsibility and the danger of that mentality. So we've got to look at it more holistically. And I, I know, you know, what I've experienced, very few people alive have experienced. I actually lived in a culture where they had been allowed to develop in their own way, you know, changing and developing, on, you know, thousands of years, where they worked a fraction of the time that we were. 
They lived in a climate that, where the weather dropped to minus 40 in the winter in a high altitude desert. And they worked a fraction of the time that we worked. No one had a mortgage to pay. No one was in debt. I mean, I say that in debt, you know, their uncle, their son, their brother was in the monastery and they supported the monasteries. That's been described as feudal. Well, feudal is fabulous compared to the banking casino that trades, you know, envelopes of mortgages and will impoverish millions of people overnight. We have to rethink a lot of ideas that we've been fed. And so anyway, the people there worked a fraction of the time that we work. They had, even in the middle of the harvest season, they were having picnics, they were having celebrations in the peak working season. And all of the work was at a relaxed pace. So my conviction is that by in an ingenious and intelligent an adapted way, working with our bodies and our hands and tools that are in the service of society, tools that are visibly really benefiting the majority of people, we could have a far, far better life than we believe that we can. And every time we help people to work in that way, we are reducing the use of minerals, the use of energy, and let's use energy for when it's really beneficial, when it really does take monotonous and really hard drudgery work out of our hands. But I have to just say on top of that, that I'm afraid that, you know, I know I'm coming from such a weird place. Most people won't believe me when I say these things. I can understand that, you know, because I've seen people building houses where there were enough people so that you were lifting a big stone or a big brick only for like 10 inches. You held it in your hand like that, you passed it on to someone else. You held it in your hand, you passed it on, singing while you did it. So I once wrote back to the West, to my friends saying, this summer has been particularly enjoyable because there was construction going on on our house. And then I suddenly realized, oh wow, <laughs> The only place in the world where I could say that. And the reason it was so enjoyable was because there was constant song the whole time while people were building. And because there were so many, the load was so light. And when they were harvesting a field, they had structures so that people would be coming from other villages and helping. And it was done so much more easily. So really, one of the... One of the things that's a problem is that when people in the 60s wanted to go back to the land in the West, a few people would go out and try to farm, try to be self-reliant. They didn't realize that one of the things that was the biggest problem of all was they just didn't have enough people to make the work easy. They didn't have the structures. They didn't have the institutions. They didn't have ways of organizing themselves with enough people for every task. Every time you were building a house, every time you were farming a field. You know, we say it takes a village to raise a child. Well, I'm saying it takes a village to harvest a field. It takes a village to build a house. And I know that we're not going to get there overnight. I know that it can sound unrealistic, but I really want people to remember that about half of humanity is still more land-based and village-based. And I really want us in, in industrialized countries to do what we can to bridge the divide to prevent those people from rushing into the city. And the city is not a city. It's a nightmare. Beijing has got the equivalent of 60 million people. There are 20 satellite cities of about two million each. It's a complete nightmare. And the pollution from that city is, you know, is now reaching the United States. So the whole issue of urbanization is completely linked to this uh, idea. Anyway, very long answer, but I think important. And I know, please read Ancient Futures if you're interested. Mm. Ancient Futures was translated into over 40 languages. And I heard from all over the world, from 40 language groups, 
and what I was describing, they kept saying, this is our story too. So I do feel substantiated in making these claims, but they become more and more rare in the modern world today. Mm. Helena, thank you so much. That was really quite a lovely way to end um, this discussion tonight. And I guess all I would like to say is all the work that I've done with um, Aboriginal peoples across Australia, they would vehemently agree with you that simplifying and connecting to land is the only thing that makes sense and the only thing that helps build a template for a healthy society. So obviously in industrialized societies, many of us love our urban lives, but there are many ways to do that in a connected way. So, um, but look, we'll start to wrap up. I just wanted to say a huge thank you. We're getting lots of lovely thank yous and uh, positive feedback on our chats, chat box. And Helena, we'd love to have you come back and talk to Nina again one day very soon. Um, but in the meantime, um, I'm sure on behalf of everyone, we'll say thank you. And I do this daggy air clap now. So <laughs> I've got their camera on. I clap, 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 clap. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Lovely to meet you all. And yeah, great, great work that you're doing. And I see there are lots of women there. Very nice to meet you. Love to stay in touch. And yeah, uh, yeah all the best. All the thank best, you. everybody. And thank you everybody else for joining us on a lovely evening. And uh, we'll be back in touch via emails and Facebook and other things soon. Good night, everybody. Thanks again, Helena. Bye.